leads me to another question that I had further down my list, but that is, when is it time to refinance, and when is it time to do a cash out refinance? Ah, those are good questions. Big, so, big questions, re, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> refinancing, not a cash out refinance, if you're just refinancing, the time to do that is anytime the interest rates are lower than what you got. <laughs> Sense. Right. So it's totally fine to be like, hey, interest rates dropped from three to two point five. All right, we'll go read a finance two point five, find a you know a, a mortgage company that'll do it for no extra cost, right? And they're just gonna refinance you, take over your mortgage essentially at two point five. All right, then take it. Right? Um you're saving money on paying interest. No, that's good. Um, then cash out refinance. I mean I could take a short answer because I think that's a big conversation, yeah. but but a cash out refinance, um, the trick is that you're you're actually paying points for a cash out refinance. So it's going to cost you, right? Even if the interest rate is lower, there's a point in which there's an equilibrium. Like, okay, you lower the interest rates and you paid you know points on you know getting a cash out refinance. At some point, you're gonna hit success. As long as that you know, or you're gonna hit where like you're saving enough money to, for it to make sense. That's depending on the rate drop, that could be like seven years, 10 years. So you want to make sure you're owning the property for long enough to make that worth it. Mm. Right. The second thing is if it's an investment property and you're doing a cash out refinance, that money has to get reinvested. Oh, okay. Right? They're like if you take cash out refinances on investment properties and you're not turning around and putting it into something else that's going to produce cash flow, like another property, then you're you're biting off like so much you're basically taking out debt against your assets to fund a lifestyle right and that becomes yeah. real risky real quick yeah. right so that always it, works out for people right when you do it that way <laughs> not that there's totally. not a time for that i think that there's always a time for that right so like you know you get 30 years down the line your properties are now like you know worth three four times as much as they were when you originally bought them you know you refinance or um you do a 1031 exchange. So that's where like you sell the property you have now and you get, you know, multiple other properties and you don't have to pay taxes on the capital gains you got on that original one. As long as you do that, um, you know, that that's essentially taking out debt against your assets again. Right. Um, you could do that and you could take some of that cash that you got out. You would have to pay taxes on it at that point, but you could do something like that. Um, and then fund your lifestyle. I think that there's a time for that, but I think that if you're just starting out and you're just figuring this yeah. stuff out, every dollar of debt you take has to produce you more money somehow. It makes sense. And, and um, yeah, being smart about it, I've, I've learned over the years, any type of investment, if I don't know what I'm doing, usually just collapses and horrible. You just get owned by all the people who know what they're doing. So I've, I've definitely uh, learned, yeah, be conservative at the beginning. Um, that kind of leads me to another question I had later down my list too, and that is, uh, roughly speaking, I know you can't predict the next thirty years exactly, but how many properties and how many years do you think you'll need until you totally survive off your your cash flow? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, um, let's see. So, um, yeah, I really don't want to like provide numbers specifically, oh, sure, like, sure. you know, I do at some point want to provide numbers. Sure, um, sure. So I don't want to provide wait. houses, but you know, the amount of years it will take, I think that the cash flow could fund my lifestyle probably in the next two to three years. The wow. trick is, and I was just, yeah. So like that, that would just be the cash flow, not the appreciation on the properties at all. That, that could fund my lifestyle in the next two to three years. And I'm really excited about that because then, you know, the appreciation also is, is a big deal. And then I have other assets like index funds and, you know, um, so I, I really like the idea that that could cover my lifestyle if it had to, not that I'm going to, but I was just doing my accounting today for my houses and I have not had a, a positive year yet because as soon as I get money, like I've been turning around and buying another property and then that property takes, you know, set up. You know, if it's an Airbnb, you got to consider like furnishing, which is probably the biggest expense, right? And then, you know, whatever repairs to the property, there's always something unforeseen. Like we just did a um, air conditioning repair on a property that I had bought, right? Because it didn't, we didn't know it because we bought it in the winter and then the summer comes along, the air conditioning unit fails and you can't like put people in a house in Texas in the middle of summer without air conditioning. No one's going to want to be there. So that costs us money, right? Um, but I haven't actually produced 
money from this process quite yet. What I'm seeing is the cost every year is just slowly going down. Yeah. Right. There's going to be a time where that flips, where I could still continue buying properties and I'm actually positive. Right. Um, but I have a feeling that when that time comes, I'll probably up my game and I'll just be buying more properties. So I don't, I, I don't exactly know. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, like if something were to happen to me, like as far as losing my job, I could just stop buying and then live off the cash flow at some point. I think that'll be in the next two to three years. Yeah. Um, that's, I like what you said. Cause to me, I'm thinking more, you know, I have a, I have a daughter and it's more about family and building wealth or if I, if I think, um, cause I used to think, okay, just do your best to you get a home and then you pay off 30 years and you have some home. And that was kind of the generic advice. Like if you're lucky enough to mm-hmm. even do that and now learning, learning from you and learning more uh, on my own, just seems like almost being in debt to creating more assets for yourself that appreciate and create cash flow is like a much better system and most successful investors have some type something like what you're talking about. So, and I see how, I don't want to say it's like addicting, but it's like, um, you see the value in it and it's exciting and you can collect more assets and build long-term wealth for your family. Um, I think you just, I don't know, I, I'm trying to get more into that mindset and I can kind of sacrifice my short term for that. So I, I appreciate that mindset. Yeah. So um, um, to, to touch on that real fast, the, um, the human brain like does a lot in terms of gamification, Right. So like you've seen that in different things like, um, you know, companies will talk about how do we gamify this thing. Right. And things like achievement unlocked or like you get a new piece of equipment in a video game or, you know, that sort of gamification releases like dopamine because it, it tells your brain that you're progressing. You're like improving, you're, you're growing. And that's how your brain operates in order to like kind of foster a growth mentality in your life. We just seem to focus that on things that don't actually matter right not to say that video games don't matter i play video games but they you know they they don't progress your life at all and so when i tell people like um the first thing you should do the very first thing you should do is um figure out what your net worth is right calculate your assets against your liabilities the next thing you gotta do is figure out the best thing you can do to grow that number you know, as fast as possibly can, as you possibly can. For most people, that's going to be like paying off debt. So if your debt's way up here, your assets are way down here, your net worth is a negative number, right? Paying off all that high interest debt is going to do the best you possibly can at getting you closer to zero, right? The second you get to zero, there's something that goes off in your brain where it's like, oh, like this is working. This makes sense. Like I, I no longer am negative, right? And then as you see that number progress forward, it, it does the same thing. It triggers those sort of like achievement unlocked gamification things that occur. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think that most wealthy people, whether they know it or not, that's what's occurring to them. Right. Which is why you see people like, and, and I've given this example before, but like Kevin O'Leary, who doesn't buy coffee at Starbucks because he knows how much the markup is. Right. So you have a rich person who could like basically drop thousand dollar bills on the ground and not notice it, refusing to buy five dollar coffee. Right. Because he's he figured out that like his brain, his well-being, like everything about him wins when he's progressing through this process. And that's what makes him feel good. That's what gives him purpose. That's what drives him forward as he's progressing. Right. And he knows, so he, he can't go backwards now and change the way that he's done that to get to this point. He still does it. Right. I know that that's not um, the most fun thing to hear. I think for people who are getting into new investors, cause they're thinking like, how do I get to a point where I could buy a Ferrari? Right. Not that that's ever out of the picture. You know, mm-hmm. that's always a possibility if you're smart and you do the, and you invest properly. Um, but like, you know, figuring out this mindset shift is probably the biggest thing that's going to take you from where you are to where you need to be. That that makes sense. Um, 100% agree with all that. A uh, couple quick questions about the actual property types before I forget. What are your thoughts on, um, on condos? You know, because there are lots mm-hmm. of opportunities, but um, HOA fees are scary. I, I know that. <laughs> I've always heard that they can... Uh, Sometimes they're fine. It's like, oh, 100 bucks or 200 bucks. And you're like, okay. But I've heard stipulations like um, 
they say like if they don't have a lot of renters or something weird happens and they might be planning on raising them to like 500 bucks a month or like things like that. So you kind of have no control over HOA, which HOA fees. And maybe I'm answering my own question, but what are your thoughts on, on condos? Um, I like condos, especially for like first time investors. Um, okay. It's difficult to do that for short term rentals because um, like the con the HOA has so much control over you know, there's probably already a rule in your HOA for a condo that says you can't have short-term rentals. They've probably already done that. Um, condos would be great for short-term rentals if HOAs didn't exist, but yeah. I don't think that that will work. But you can get in so much lower and do a long-term rental for a condo. Um, like you said, like I, I would look at the HOA rules very closely, read through all the rules, talk to people who have lived there, um, find yeah. out what their long-term kind of goals are and stuff because you know an hoa can vote to raise you know rates but they're voting they're voting to raise rates on themselves too right so yeah like they can all get together and like raise stuff but there, there's a limit in which the people are you know willing to suffer for the hoa you know when it's their own money too right That's so true. um yeah. yeah that could happen i would just kind of you know make sure that you give maybe an added buffer on that one count that as another unknown that you may need a little bit more cash flow to cover that right? makes but, sense. Um, if you could afford it, and the reason I like the condos is because it's it's such a low barrier of entry for people who are getting involved in you know real estate. But if you could afford it, uh, multiplexes produce so much more money, right? But then you know they they cost more, so that's yeah. True. And yeah, so I've heard um, yeah I've heard the house hacking thing, um, kind of like what you're saying. Live in a place for a year whether it's even just just a duplex or it has a mother-in-law suite or a second or a cottage attached something that you can rent out while you're living there mm -hmm. for the first year um, that pretty much can pay for most of your mortgage or something like that um i was wondering did you have any tricks on finding places like that or is it just mm -hmm. talking to agents and and doing that i don't know if you have yeah. any, any tricks on i mean talking to agents is always the like one of the biggest things um, in Zillow and Redfin, there's a way to look for multiplexes, right? Um, all, so what the way this works is like anybody selling a property goes into a system called the MLS, which I forget what that stands for. Something listing service. Um, yeah, I forget what that stands for, but you have to be a certified real estate agent to be in the MLS system, but Redfin and Zillow and, you know, a few other companies have access to the data that's in the MLS and they scrape that data periodically, right? So like what you see in Redfin and Zillow is only like a smidgen behind what's in the MLS, right? So, you know, maybe back in the day, looking at stuff on Zillow was kind of tough, you know, in a market where it's a seller's market and stuff is like, you know, going off the market before it even shows up on the market, you know, Zillow and Redfin is behind, but you know, as the market's switching, like even now stuff is staying on the market for weeks at a time. I think Zillow and Redfin are fine. I see. Yeah, it's saying like price cuts. I'm seeing lots of price cuts on there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of more of a sign that it's going down. 